So what's it take these days for a bike shop to survive? And what's up with this weird fat tire uh, road bike trend? In this episode of PLP Talks, I interview Kyle B. Kelly, the owner of Golden Saddle Cyclery, as well as regular contributor to the Rathavis, and we talk about his bike shop, Golden Saddle. He tells us how his customers have grown and changed with the shop and how they address that, how they use the shop to build bike community, and also his favorite bourbons and portrait photographers. We talk about a lot of stuff, cover a lot of topics. It's a super entertaining interview. And this interview, just like the others, is is supported by listeners and viewers like you. So if you love this content, be sure to check out how to support the channel, how to support these videos in the YouTube description below or in the show notes if you're listening to it via podcast form. This episode is also supported by the Ramble Ride. Check them out at ramblerides.com. Imagine all the things you love about bikepacking, the challenge of carrying your gear, the amazing remote and scenic routes, and the camaraderie amongst friends at the end of the day. Without the things you dislike about bikepacking, the planning, the logistics, the carrying your food and having to cook, and you have the Ramble Ride. The Ramble Ride is a unique, semi-supported bikepacking experience. We got a chance to ride the Oregon one last year and it was truly a stunning event. It took us on roads and places that we never knew existed. So if you're looking for a different kind of cycling event that is part challenge and all fun, then definitely check out the Ramble Ride at ramblerides.com. All right, so with all that aside, put in those earbuds, pretend like you're working at your desk. It's okay, I won't tell anyone, promise, and enjoy the show. And uh, today's guest, you probably follow him on Instagram or are familiar with the bike shop that he runs. Uh, today we're gonna talk with Kyle B. Kelly from Golden Saddle Cycle- Cyclery in Los Angeles. Uh, so Kyle, thanks so much for being on the show. Of course, thanks for having me. Yeah, so you, your shop, um, you've run it for eight years. How did it get started initially? Uh, initially, me and Thomas Wood were working at a bike shop called Orange 20. And uh, our good friend, who was one of the part owners there, uh, was leaving. So both him and I decided to leave as well. And Ty Hathaway was working at Euro Asia Imports at the moment. And uh, we all just decided to try to make something happen. And we did. Cool. So I remember like one of my first interactions with um golden saddles golden saddles the brand was actually through a cycling cap with intelligentsia how'd that come about well when we first opened intelligentsia was much smaller than they are now not owned by pete um they had just moved to los angeles so we had made a lot of friends with the baristas there um and they had a lot more to do with what was happening with the company at that time uh so we decided to make a cap with them and it it was crazy. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> what was the response like? Um, I mean, people were confused at first because a lot of people didn't even know Intelligency was in Los Angeles yet. Um, you know, they were a Chicago brand, moved to Los Angeles and uh, started third wave, second wave coffee, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it was good. You know, a lot of people bought the cap because of Intelligentsia. Um, a lot of people bought the cap because of us. And I don't think either of us could you know, have a bad thing to say about what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I mean, the design was so striking. And also the thing I thought was cool was, you know, bikes and coffee have been like a thing informally, but just to see like a formal marriage of it in a product was like, whoa, that's awesome. Someone's actually kind of capitalized on that. (laughs) I mean, the thing is most rides start at coffee shops. So, you know, why not have a partnership with somebody, especially one that's so close to you, you know, they're only two blocks away from us down on Sunset. Um, and a lot of people don't know, but the cap is actually designed from old Blackburn saddlebags. Oh, really? Uh, wow. <laughs> there's these saddlebags that use textiles for their side panels. And uh, the first one I found is the first cap that we have. We found another saddlebag. That's the second cap. Um, and then we saw a picture of a third one, which we don't have the third one. Uh, but we do have the other two saddlebags that we kind of mimic the design from the textiles on those side panels. Wow. How old were those saddlebags? They had to have been real old Yeah, because they, they looked pretty haggard. I would <laughs> say probably early 90s. Early 90s? Yeah. If you actually come to the shop in one of our display cases, like our museum case, we have both saddlebags that we own. And we would love to have all of them. <laughs> if anyone out there has one of these saddlebags, 
please send it to us. We will give you money. <laughs> nice. They're like Pokemon. You got to catch them all. <laughs> so you've had this shop for eight years. How How has your vision for the shop or how has the shop changed over that time? Um, the shop hasn't changed much over that time. Um, the shop has grown and the customers of the shop have grown. Uh, it, it was a pretty crazy thing that happened. I felt like when we opened this bike shop, we had a, a lot of newcomers to cycling use us. And with that, they have grown with us. You know, they, they came in with fixed gear conversions that they were commuting on. And now they're full blown mountain bikers somehow. Like we don't know how it happened, but it did. <laughs> So has your product line changed with, I guess, kind of like your, your customer base at the same time? Well, you, yeah, the, the customer base never changed, but their attitudes towards cycling changed. Uh, but product line didn't change. You know, we're still a fat tired road bike shop. Um, mm -hmm. We sell more fat tired road bikes than anything. Um, originally, cyclocross bikes before there was a fat tired road bike. Uh, but now we got a lot of customers really interested in mountain biking because uh, Ty and I have always mountain biked, so we've just kind of got more people on board as the years have gone by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems like uh, you know, we, we saw the, re the new releases from Surly and uh, All City with these fat tire road bikes. Like, When did you at the shop see that as a trend? Was that early on from the very beginning, or was there a certain point when that really started to catch hold? Uh, I mean, from the beginning, Ty and I were riding our cyclocross bikes like road bikes. Uh, there's just so many fire roads in the Angeles Forest that are closed to cars that, you know, just miles and miles. So we were just riding these cross bikes, these uncomfortable <laughs> to race and close quarters bicycles for hundreds of miles. Uh, so it was it was bound to happen. I don't know who did it first, but I mean, it was very important for us and, and for our customer because a lot of our customers that don't even ride dirt. You know, having a road bike with a 40C tire on it just makes more sense for commuting. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people seem to kind of poo-poo like the new trend of gravel bikes. Like, do you think there is like an appreciable difference for one to, to, to get one that's like gravel adventure specific? Oh, of course. I mean, it's a bike that's meant to be on for long hours. You can't ever say that about a cyclocross bike. No nope. <laughs> cyclocross bike to be on for more than an hour. So it makes total sense. Yeah. <clears throat> do people get kind of, are people confused by the adventure bike or do they get it? Uh, here, I think they get it. I yeah. think they're probably confused in places that have larger cycle cross scenes. Um, also, I mean, we are very public, you know, we're out there, so they see what we're using the bike for. So it's, it's hard not to get it. You right. came in and you didn't get it and you knew <laughs> us, I would be like, uh, I don't know, maybe you just shouldn't have any of these bikes. Right. <laughs> you <have> e bike. <laughs> So is there like a particular brand or model that, that, that seems to be really popular in your shop? Um, the, I mean, the Space Horse, in my opinion, is one of the greatest bikes ever made. Uh, I love the Canty version. I rode it for years. The new disc version, I love it as well. Uh, that's kind of the gateway drug, you know, to get yourself interested in all of this. And then uh, obviously we sell a lot of the Stinner Romeros. That bike is changed my life you know i have one of the first ones that could fit 27 and a half by two inches and i could basically ride to mountain bike trails and then ride mountain bike trails with the bike <laughs> so that's been a really good bike for us the niner rlt steel i love building those i love selling those that's an awesome bicycle uh, those are going to be those are our three like main go-to whenever it comes to like a, a gravel style fat tire road bike is what we like to call it yeah have you had a chance to throw a leg over uh, a Midnight Special or a Gorilla Monsoon? The Gorilla Monsoon, I rode one that was way too large for me <laughs> a year ago uh, when the bike was first out here in Los Angeles for its photo, original photo shoot and like, testing period with Jeff. Um, Midnight Special I have not been able to ride. I'm pretty excited about it. Really excited about that whiskey uh, paint to match fork that uh, Ben, you got to make. <laughs> excited about that bike the pacer was one of our all-time favorite road bikes you know we always wanted road bikes with 32c tires anyways then the mr pink came out and that was kind of my go-to road bike at that point 
I'm currently riding a Cosmic Stallion with 650B by 47C tires. Mm -hmm. As a normal road bike, you know, I do 100% paved rides on that bicycle. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, All City as a brand's been killing it lately. Like, I have a, a Canty uh, Space Horse that I love, and, like, I kept thinking the only thing that would make it better is if it were, if it could take 650B and disc brakes. And, uh, you know, they've done that, and they've kind of really... They, they, kept... they took care of that. Yeah. <laughs> One thing, the Gorilla Monsoon rides a lot better with the 650B wheels. I have a Space Horse disc built up with 650B wheels, and I'm not quite sold like I was with the Canty version. Um, so I'm looking forward to the Gorilla Monsoon and swapping all my parts over to that with the 650B platform. Do you know if it has, like, a... Does it have a similar geo to this Space Horse, or has it been tweaked? It's in... a little bit more dirt-oriented. Okay. Uh, and I think once putting my smaller 2-inch tire on it instead of, like, a 2.2... It'll bring the bottom bracket down a little bit, and it'll be the perfect bike for me. Yeah, yeah. How how tall are you? Are you a shorter rider? Or? I'm a pretty short, I'm five seven. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing I'm like super stoked about. Like I, I ride small frames, and like whenever I'm on a 29er bike or 700C with like 45s, I always feel like I'm gonna topple over. <laughs> I was riding one of the dual suspension Niners for a while, and that thing was when I fell from it. I was already like four feet off the ground higher than I normally would be on a bicycle. So it was always scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm super stoked on like this uh, 650B 27.5 trend, uh, particularly as a smaller rider. I feel like some people are going to poo-poo it and say, oh, this is just the industry trying to sell you more stuff. But I think like for people that ride smaller frames, there's like a real like functional advantage to, to getting one. Oh, for sure. And functional advantage, but more than anything, it, it allows you to ride more things. It, if you poo poo it, it makes no sense because you can only have one. You can have one bike that can do everything. Um, it doesn't do everything well, but if you're only going to have one bike, a 650B by 47 slick, you can do pretty much anything with it. I ride my Cosmic Stallion on single track and have no issues. Right. Cool. Yeah, you guys seem to find uh, a lot of dirt riding, even though you're in Los Angeles. I think a lot of people have a misconception of what riding a bike is like in Los Angeles, but you guys have been able to find all like the cool hidden gems. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dirt. Let's just <laughs> that way. I mean, we have, it's one of the only places you can ride from sea level to over 10,000 feet in one sitting. You know, you can't really say that for anywhere else in this. Well, maybe you can. Hawaii, <laughs> Hawaii, Los Angeles. You can ride from sea level to 10,000 feet. So what's kind of your, your favorite mixed terrain ride in the area? Oh, uh, I'm, I would say it's actually not even in the San Gabriel's, the Angeles Forest. My favorite mixed terrain ride starts from the bike shop, goes up a road called Nichols Canyon that has a little dirt offshoot called Dirt Nichols. You take that to Mulholland, Mulholland to a trail called Betty B. Deering that go, it parallels Mulholland to a spot called Tree People. Then you get back on Mulholland at that point, you ride Mulholland to Dirt Mulholland, and then you can either take Dirt Mulholland to Topanga Creek Cyclery and come down to Panga Creek uh, to the PCH, or you can come down earlier, things like Sullivan Ridge, Sullivan Canyon, ride a little bit more single track. So mm -hmm. it depends if I'm on a more aggressive drop bar dirt bike, I usually take the single track down, but if I'm on like more of a road bike or a single speed or something like that, I usually take the route to Topanga Creek. Do you have a favorite bike for that, for, for that kind of loop? Um, no, because I've I've ridden almost all of my bikes on that loop, and it, I have just as much fun every time. You know, whenever I ride a rigid mountain bike, the single track stuff and the jumps are a lot more fun. But all in all, you know, I guess probably riding a road bike is my favorite, just because it's a little bit more challenging. And it's faster, so I can actually get back to work in time. Right. <laughs> you got to be at work. You know, you start early and you get here. We open at 11, so... I can do pretty much any ride that I want before work, which is nice. Right. Yeah, I totally love uh, the concept of uh, underbiking, like where you take a, a slightly less appropriate bike just to, to add like some technical challenge to it. <laughs> I'm glad that's a thing now because I've always really enjoyed that. I think all of us here really enjoyed that. Yeah. We um, tend to real road bikes with 723C tires on single track sometimes. So. <laughs> nice. Tend take people on rides with road bikes on single track. So is that, um, so do you get, you guys lead like, um, uh, rides from the shop? We have one ride 
we don't have any rides actually from the shop because we open later. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on Friday mornings at 7 a.m., we meet at Intelligentsia down the street um, every Friday. And that ride is always different. It can be a cross ride, a road ride, even a mountain bike ride. When it's a mountain bike ride, we meet at a trailhead instead of the coffee shop. But other than that, um, and then Wednesdays are kind of a, like, if you know, in the know kind of thing, if you show up to the bike shop on a Tuesday and Jimmy tells you where we're mountain biking, then you go. It's not something we make public uh, just because hurting cats on a mountain bike ride can be kind of crazy. But anyone who comes in on Tuesdays and asks Jimmy where we're going, we always tell him. So that's kind of the two current rides. Wednesday, we're closed, so we're able to go mountain biking, go a little bit further, go a little bit longer. And then Friday mornings, we actually open at noon instead of 11, so we can go a little bit further on those rides as well. Mm -hmm. So for the Friday ride, is that mostly locals, or do you have people coming from out of town to ride with you guys? It... uh, uh, it's mostly locals. I'd say 75% locals, but almost every ride you do have somebody coming from out of town, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like what's the furthest someone's come for to, to do a ride? Uh, New Zealand. Oh, really? Dang. <laughs> came for the ride, but they were from New Zealand and uh, they came on our ride, which yeah. was quite awesome. Yeah. Cool. Europe all the time, but New Zealand furthest. And how Japan. do they... How do they figure out? Yeah. Do they just find it, find out through Instagram or? Following us on Instagram because we do post on Thursday evening what we're doing, what kind of ride it is, where we're going kind of thing. Sometimes if the ride's really hard, we don't say where we're going. Though. <laughs> we don't want people to not show up. It's a no drop ride, so we, we all get through it. We all have breakfast burritos at the end. Nice. <laughs> Uh, so one of the, the comments I hear the most about um, Golden Saddle as a bike shop is that you guys do a pretty good job at uh, fostering community in the area. Like, how does that fit into the mission of the bike shop? Uh, I mean, first off, you have to have community to have anyone coming anywhere or word of mouth. You know, we don't advertise. Everything is word of mouth. Obviously, Instagram is a form of advertising, but... The Instagram is more fun than anything. I think all of us think our Instagrams are just fun. We just want to show people that we are having fun and we actually ride bikes, <laughs> unlike some bike shops. Uh, you know, every night if you come to this bike shop, there will be at least five to 20 people hanging out in the alleyway. Um, that's probably one of the coolest things I think the bike shop has harvested. Uh, it is, it's, it's a clubhouse in People come here every day just to hang out from noon to eight when we close. There'll be somebody here not to buy anything, but just to hang out. Mm -hmm. Was that? Well, another crazy thing is, which I've in interviews, I've talked about this before, is people that are local that don't know each other meet each other. And then all of a sudden you have best friends from one day sitting on the bench drinking a beer at Golden South Psych 3. And that just blows my mind that that happens. Was that by design from the very beginning or was that just kind of like an organic thing that that happened? It was an organic thing that happened. Um, We never thought the bike shop would be a hangout. We thought it was going to be a bike shop, a really cool bike shop. But then it it turned out being a really cool hangout more than (laughs) a bike shop. So I'd say it's more of a hangout than a bike shop these days. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been kind of fascinated by that idea of a bike shop as as a third space, you know, cause it seems like in the, the, the time of the internet, like the value proposition for a bike shop has to kind of change. Like it has to offer other kind of, uh, you know, bits of value, whether it's a community space, uh, to, to, to still stay top of mind these days. Yeah. I mean, you have to give the customer something that they can't get on the internet and, you know, a normal conversation about life is that okay. <laughs> the internet can't Amazon Prime that? <laughs> no. You can order beers, but they cost money. We give them away. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the uh, outside vignette uh, that you were in just recently. It was this uh, cool series of, uh, I think, mostly uh, California, if not LA-based cyclists, uh, and giving like a different snapshot of the cycling life. How'd that come about? Uh, Tracy, who shot the photos, is a good friend of Liz, my fiance. And she shot Liz for the, for the vignette, for the outside thing. And she asked Liz if I'd be interested. And being a photographer, 
I I love portraiture. It's my favorite. You know, someone asked the other day, what is the best portraiture lens? And I said, whatever lens is on your camera. <laughs> that's what matters to me. Um, so when she asked me, of course, I said, yes. When I found out I had to write a story, I was a little nervous at that point because writing is not my strong suit. I have to do it quite often for the Radivist, and I don't like doing it. But, you know, it, it, the end product is always fun. Um, and this was very, this was a more of a serious story. You know, it, it's about, like, why you ride a bike and, you know, scar stories. And so it was it was interesting, but at the end of the day, I was very happy that I did it. And Tracy takes beautiful photos, um, very different than the kind of photos I take too. So I just love looking at her work and seeing all of the all the people that got their portraits taken, reading all the stories. I mean, it was, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So like I've, um, like I really kind of related to your story um, because we've, kind of had that uh, dilemma of making the thing that we love into our work as well. And it's this constant like tension. <laughs> you know, it, it's stressful and, and people, you know, people look at Instagram and they're like, Oh, they live the best life. I'm like, I do. I live the best life, but it is stressful sometimes. You know, when you go on a bike ride and it's work, you have to think about, you know, where you're going. If you're going to take a photo, that kind of thing is, it gets it gets wild and you know that whole that whole thing in my head was playing out very different than it ended up playing out and i'm so grateful that i made that decision in the end to make it about us and not about this story of riding from the lowest then hiking to the highest and then asking her to marry me um, instead we just hung out in hot springs for two days straight and then hiked mount whitney it was amazing <laughs> Yeah, it's weird. Like when um, you know, part of uh, your job is to create media because you're always kind of looking at things through like a filter. You know, can I turn this into content or an article or something? Um, like for me, you know, like a, a vacation is like a bike ride when I don't take the camera. <laughs> you know, for me, I I just always have the camera with me. I always have since I was a kid, so I always have that whether I pull it out is another story, you know, cause you just never know what you're going to see. Right. I, you know, people say the best camera you can have is the one that's on you. I actually bought a new iPhone to have the better camera just in case I didn't have the real camera. <laughs> uh, so that's been fun. The video on the new, the new iPhone is, is awesome. Is it? Yes. <laughs> uh, so how do you, uh, how do you set bounds for yourself? Like, do you say like, okay, I'm totally just going to experience this moment and not worry about content creation or, you know, are there boundaries? No, no, <laughs> I, I wish I could say there were boundaries, you know, when, when it is something with Liz, there's obviously boundaries, but she knows as well as I know if we're driving across the country and I find out about a bike shop, I'm, I'm stopping. And most likely I'm going to photograph the bike shop because that's what really, it matters a lot to me to spread local bike shops, you know, and get people to understand that a bike shop really should be the place you're buying bike parts. It shouldn't be the internet. Um, we're going to probably be the ones putting them on. You know, I also think bike shops should be charging more to put on parts from the internet. There's, I mean, th that's a whole nother story. We don't need to talk about that, but <laughs> Liz has come to the realization if we are somewhere and I find out about a bike shop, I, I will stop there. I have to. There's nothing I can do about it. It just draws me there. Nice. So what's the, <clears throat> what's the funkiest, like, quirky bike shop that you've ever stumbled upon just traveling? Um, quirky, funny, That that's a hard one. Um, yeah, because uh, Laura and I totally do the same thing, or I, or I do the same thing. Like when I'll, I'll Google search the area, and if there's a bike shop, like oh, I just want to see what's inside. Um, the weirdest one for us, or I think most is interesting, was the Bisbee Bicycle Brothel. I don't know if you've been to I, that one. I've never been to Bisbee Bicycle Brothel. So, did you go in the old space, or were you in the new space? Uh, we went. We we've seen both. So we okay. uh, we saw the old space uh, when we were bike touring across the country, and then. Uh, I think two years ago we visited with Ken when he reopened it and then we got to see the new space as well. So what, what was the reasoning behind reopening the shop? Uh, he wanted something to do. I mean, he was retired and like he had all the stuff in his garage and he's like, you know, you know, I just want to 
interact with people and and do something interesting and st and still show off the the bikes. So, yeah, yeah I would de I, I would definitely go check it out sooner than later. It's like, I, space is cool too. Yeah, yeah. It's, seen it's, photos from that old shop. It was just one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. We tried to go. David and I used to live in Tucson. Uh, we tried to go for one of the closing weekends, but it was just too crazy here, so we couldn't make it. Um, and I have my answer, orange peel in uh, Colorado. Okay. Have you been there? I have not. It shop looks like a giant orange. It's crazy. <laughs> it's wild. That's the quirkiest, funniest bike shop I've ever been to. Like the, as in like the buildings, like a giant? It is a giant orange. Wow. <laughs> I was on drugs, but I think the building was a giant orange. Nice. Went through, I did um, a ride with Niner uh, a couple years ago from Fort Collins to Steamboat Springs. And we ended there uh, after a hailstorm over Buffalo Pass into uh, Steamboat Springs and Orange Peels there. I went straight there to check it out and it was wild. Nice. <laughs> so what do you think, um, you know, there's kind of mixed news about bike shops, um, the current state of the bike shops, like a lot of them are closing. What do you think a bike shop has to do to, to remain successful and viable these days? Uh, care. <laughs> That's it. That's yeah. really care and listen and you'll be fine. But so many bike shops aren't ever going to care or listen. Um, the bike shops that are closing most likely probably should be the ones closing. Um, you know, that's, that's hard because, you know, teaching someone to actually care again after so long is very difficult. Um, some people are able to do it. Some people aren't, you know, but if you care about your customer that walks through, you actually want them to ride bicycles and you want them to have a better life, then you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep, how do you keep that alive? Like after many years, like, I, I feel like, like, you know, you can be passionate about that for maybe like two, three, five years, but like in the long game, like how do you keep that kind of kindling of caring alive? Uh, for me, it's pretty easy cause I just love humans. And I think all humans are, are great people. Um, until proven guilty, uh, you know, in riding bikes, if you still ride a bike, you'll be fine. Uh, because you meet new people, you discover new things. Uh, the bike is, keeps you a kid. As long as you're a kid and you're having fun, you're always going to care about the people that come into your bike shop because you want them to experience the same thing you are. You know, I'm 35 years old now. I feel like I'm 24. Um, I ride a bike more than I ever have in my life. You know, it's, absolutely amazing and i just want other people to feel the same way mm -hmm. did you do you go to uh frostbike this year i did go to frostbike this year i actually went to frostbike not as golden south Psych three though i went as press for the radivis yeah. um nabs and frostbike were, were on the same weekend which is the craziest thing i've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> needs to know not to do things like that right <laughs> I heard, did you sit in on the, I heard that Toby and Bobby gave a, a talk to bike shops. Uh, I, I did not see that one cause I'm pretty sure it was at the same time as Leah Benson's seminar and I was there for hers and it was outstanding. She's right. an amazing woman doing awesome things in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I forward to getting up there to shoot that bike shop. Yeah. Sooner than later. <laughs> cool. Yeah, because I heard that as uh, I got an email from Toby, he was telling me a, a little bit about his presentation. It was essentially that message, like you know, you have to care about your customer, and you know, kind of wake up and not be grumpy, and 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 kind of share you know the excitement about bikes to to be successful. Yeah, I'm, there's no other way to do it. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> so, what are um, what are bike shops that that you look up to, that you think have done it well? I, I think Monkey Wrench Cycles is one of the most outstanding bike shops I've ever been to. Uh, Durango Cyclery is Golden South Cyclery in Durango, which I think is really cool. Um, they'll be shooting bottle rockets out of windows at midnight, <laughs> which I'm a fan of. Uh, I really like what Josh at Angry Catfish has done. Um, he's taken the fun concept and made it actually work. Uh, that shop employs, you know, 15 or so people, which is just crazy to me. Uh, other than that, uh, Fresh Air, Travis's old shop in San Francisco, 
was really bummed when he closed that shop. But after talking to him, it made a lot of sense what he did going to Paul. Uh, I mean, there's just too many. There, mm -hmm. I, I love when I go into a bike shop and it feels like it's 30 years older than it is. I love going into an organized bike shop because mine is not organized. Um, and kind of learning from them. That's one thing I really, really like about Angry Catfish. It's a very organized bike shop. They're doing things properly. I don't think we do anything properly here. <laughs> I mean, things hanging on our walls are not for sale, which don't do that. People <laughs> ask all the time. Uh, but yeah, there's just, there's just too many. There's wonderful bike shops all over the world, and that's why no one should be buying anything from the internet. Yeah, we, uh, we've been to Angry Catfish a couple times, and they had that place dialed. I mean, they've got the cafe space and, like, just their display. And I love, like, the open workshop. It's it's a pretty cool, cool like, just space to be in. Yeah, it, it's quite nice. Uh, Sunday mornings there is just crazy. There's, like, 40 people in a bike shop. I mean, they're not all there for bikes, obviously, but it's just crazy to think 40 people are in one bike shop without, you know, ultra romance being there right <laughs> it's the only way we've ever gotten 40 people in here <laughs> celebrity appearances <laughs> so what's been uh over the years like what's been the biggest challenge that you've had with the shop money money <laughs> by far yeah um, you don't make money in the bike business uh not at all but it's worth it so if it if it's something you want to do and you're passionate about it i highly recommend opening your own bike shop but you'll never you'll never be rich you'll always <laughs> worry about money uh, that's been the biggest challenge um other than that you know making time to ride your bike uh that's a really hard one if you're not an early person you know you kind of have to adjust for how you're going to ride your bike because i mean you're going to be here 50 60 hours a week uh, luckily I, I am a bit of an early bird, so I get up early and I ride before I come to work. Um, it also makes the day so much better. It's so much more pleasant. You know, I don't have to commute to work cause I live three blocks away from the bike shop. Uh, so a lot of people get that ride in by commuting, but for me, I get to go ride in the mountains and then come back and go to work and it's spectacular. Mm -hmm. So where, what do you see the, uh, I mean, do you have any, what are the future plans for golden saddle? Um, for Golden Saddle, I mean, just to exist, um, and be a driving force behind, you know, changing the bike industry, uh, getting people off race bikes that aren't racing, you know, keeping things fun. Uh, that's, that's for Golden Saddle Psych 3, you know, other than that, there's a lot of other things I would like to do, uh, outside of the bike world, uh, not really outside of the bike world, bicycle themed, uh, coffee shops. Are cool but I want to do something a little bit different I want to open up a coffee shop uh, that kind of is more for a base camp for mountain bikers rather than you know a road cycling mecca uh, I want to open a pizza shop bike shop somewhere uh, not in Los Angeles probably that's a little bit further down the road uh, maybe Colorado nice. we'll see <laughs> I'd love to see like a, a bike shop slash distillery <laughs> I mean that would be a great thing, and it would smell awesome. <laughs> uh, one of the greatest things is going to distilleries just because that smell, you know, the mash is just such a wonderful smell. Uh, every time I go home, I'm from southern Indiana. Uh, we always go to Louisville and go to some of the distilleries with my parents. Mm -hmm. It's always a good time. I once shot uh, the Buffalo Trace distillery for the Radivis. If you didn't see those photos, go look at them because it was beautiful. It was nice. awesome. Great time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be cool. That's a little, you know, that's a little scary at some point. <laughs> I don't know if lawyers would be into that. No. You know, be smart enough. I don't know. I don't get how Velo Cold does it. I mean, if we had an actual bar, I, it would be a bad thing. <laughs> have an Uber account just set up for customers. Yeah. Just to send them home. <laughs> we pay for their Uber. They have to pay for a tune-up while we hold on to their bike, I guess. That could work. There you go. That'd be good. good fusion. <laughs> Yeah, Laura and I have uh, gotten into uh, whiskeys uh, more seriously like the last couple of years um, just because it, you, it's a little bit less bloaty than, than throwing back some beers, you yeah, know? it's true, but, you know, <laughs> you too much whiskey. That's true. <laughs> Person. Uh, I drink a lot of whiskey. Uh, I like whiskey a lot. Um, 
you know, what are your going, favorites? Um, Colonel Taylor single barrel is by far my, my favorite bourbon. Um, I love rise, uh, the high West double rye mm-hmm. love that, uh, other than that fighting cock, uh, super affordable, super strong bourbon. Uh, it's like 1999 a bottle, but it's strong. Uh, stag john just gave me one of his old bottles of stag that it's too hard to drink uh i once i once drank so much of his house in austin that i couldn't talk the next day because <laughs> it's high in alcohol that i burnt my throat oh dang <laughs> it's bad i think it's stag jr stag yeah. jr is the strong one yeah yeah we've been uh, kind of experimenting a little bit with uh scotches and uh irish whiskeys as of late which are like super easy drinkers like yeah. i know it tastes a little too sweet for me, um, and scotch is too smoky. I don't. I love my food to taste smoky, but I don't like liquids that taste smoky. Uh, so that's a hard one for me. So mostly I just drink rye and bourbons. We did a, a whiskey tasting here in town, and it's interesting when you drink different things on the tail of other things because it'll change the flavor profile. So yeah. like I'll drink something moderately smoky and then something really smoky. When I go back to the moderately smoky one, all of a sudden it tastes sweet. <laughs> it doesn't taste anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit uh, about photography since you, you, you do so much of it. Were you formally trained or was it just something you just picked up? I went to school for film and photography. Uh, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I came out here uh, to work in the movie industry. Uh, I was working at a post-production house that edited movie trailers when I first came out, uh, but it drove me crazy. Uh, I was working long hours. Uh, It was a very stressful job. Producers are not kind people. Um, And even if you didn't screw something up, it's always your fault. (laughs) That's kind of, that's why I left that industry and I I made my hobby, you know, my life. um, And then I made my work, my hobby again. So it it worked out. for the better I, it's, it's been a lot less stressful in the bike industry yeah yeah so what kind of um so are portraits your your favorite kind of subject matter or be a, a very different photo uh we're shooting a landscape it it's the same it doesn't doesn't change much i mean yeah you can have a cloudy sky then you can have a sunny sky but you know it, it's not like a person you you're not getting the personality coming out in the photo and that's what matters most to me. Mm-hmm. Do you have any like visual influences in terms of the portraits? Um, Guy Bourdain is one of my favorite photographers of all times. Um, Cause of the colors and the way he shot uh, his models. He was a fashion photographer. If, if you guys don't know, uh, unbelievable. Other than that, you know, that was probably, he was probably my biggest influence. And then, uh, of course, Helmut Newton. You know, when I whenever I was going to school, I was I was studying a lot of fashion photographers, um, especially fashion photographers that would tell stories um, and were a little bit edgy. Uh, you know, Deanne Arbus. Everybody, if you say you don't like her photos, you're lying. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel like those three are total cop outs, but they're cop outs for a reason. It's like. If someone has good pad thai, order it. Right. It, you know, like good pad thai is amazing. You know? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to say those three because, you know, they definitely changed the way I looked at the world. Uh, you know, Helmut Newton and Guy Bourdain are very similar, uh, where Deanne Arbus is uh, very different. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when the uh, Deanne Arbus show was traveling, I think I saw it three times, like one the in San Francisco and, and in New York and I think in L.A. So. Yeah. It yeah. was pretty fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I was a big fan of uh, Abaddon as well. Like, it was interesting to, to hear kind of like the, the mind games that he would play with his portrait subjects to kind of like evoke a moment. And I thought that was, that, that kind of blew my mind when it was, when when it dawned on me that, you know, you, ju- you don't just like capture a moment necessarily, but there is like some construction leading up to that moment and you can kind of yeah. influence the image. Yeah. I mean, as a photographer, you learn that you can easily influence the person in front of you especially if you're remotely funny, you know, you can (laughs) change the whole scene. The thing about Abaddon, which is so crazy to me, the the amount of personality that would come from a photo with a completely white backdrop. uh, I mean, a lot of times environmental portraits are how you can 
understand someone, but he would take people, put them in front of a white backdrop, and you knew everything about that person. I mean, that was just crazy to me. Um, he also pulled back a little bit further so you could see the clothes, um, but that was mind melting. Whenever yeah. I saw Richard Avedon for the first time, and what he was able to accomplish with you know even a white backdrop, pretty pretty wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a. Uh, he was so good at like just like drawing out the, like the the quintessence of like a person, or at least his. Yeah. At, least, at least his perception of, you know, the essence of a person. It's which, always our perception of the person that's going to get photographed. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, what they, like, that's another thing. Although it's like a portrait of someone else, in some ways it's kind of like a, a self-portrait or like you're kind of, I don't know, you know, what you're perceiving the person and you get the final say. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that is, that makes sense. But I mean, more than anything, I feel like as a portrait photographer, uh, the things you have in common with your subject are what comes out when you're shooting someone. Um, so when a cyclist photographer is shooting another cyclist, um, it's really easy for that to come out. You know, So when Tracy was shooting these cyclists, I mean, you could really tell that I, when she was shooting these photos, you know, she knew how to make you know their story before you even read the story, uh, which was pretty fantastic. Yeah. So do you have a, I know this is kind of a dumb question, like asking what your favorite bike is, but do you have a favorite camera other than the iPhone? <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't have a favorite camera. Uh, I love shooting all, all kinds of cameras. Uh, the Mamiya 7, in my opinion, is one of the greatest cameras ever made. Um, I own a Leica M7, which I can't say is the greatest camera ever made. <laughs> I love death, but it's not the greatest camera ever made. Um, it's cool that it's, it does have aperture priority, but like a their their downfall was computers uh, <laughs> the camera isn't great and it runs through batteries like crazy um digital camera is a fuji x pro 2 um that's about two years old now and it's about to die <laughs> <laughs> uh the shutter release barely works anymore it was funny uh nicholas that works a little bit for kitsbo was down here recently and i was trying to shoot a panning shot of him and my shutter just was not working so I then started having to hit the shutter about five seconds before I wanted the photo to take. <laughs> Never worked out. <laughs> so I'm going to have to get that thing fixed or get a new one or something. Yeah. That's like some ninja style photography Photography when you anticipate that long. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, you have to. When your shutter's not working, there's nothing you can do about that. So you got to work with what the camera's giving you. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's wrap up a little bit on, on bikes. Um, do you, what are the, the next bike trends that you're seeing? Um, you know, I, I don't think I look that far ahead. I, I very much live in the day that I'm, I'm living. Uh, mountain biking is not going anywhere. Uh, enduro style, like shuttling is, is going down. Uh, more people are riding mountain bikes, um, as, you know, XC bikes, they're climbing, uh, that's going to be a, an awesome thing in Los Angeles, you know, bringing the kind of like 90s mountain bike culture back to mountain biking here um, is something that we've always wanted to see happen. And it looks like it finally is happening. Uh, hopefully touring bikes on pavement come back because there's nothing better than seeing the place you live than touring on pavement. Uh, yeah, touring on dirt's great, but you just don't run into as many people. You don't hear as many stories. Uh, you know, those are the two things that I want to see stay and come back uh you know mountain biking to me i absolutely it's funny they're exact opposite of each other I like mountain biking because i get away from the world and i'm in remote places but then i want you to go touring on pavement <laughs> i guess that makes sense so, those are those are two go-tos do you sure. have you like i've heard that that general interest in like pure road cycling is going down do you see that to be the case or um you know, in Los Angeles, no, it, it will always, there'll be a huge road scene here. Um, I love riding road bikes. Uh, there's nothing like going that fast and that long. Uh, you know, for me, I just, it just made no, it didn't make any sense to have a 700 by 28 C bicycle. Um, I'd rather have something that I could ride on the pavement exclusively or something if I'm on a paved ride and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I've never ridden that fire road before. I can go ride it. Uh, 
I've had no issues with riding the 47C tires on pavement with road cyclists. Uh, I also, if someone drops me, I just, whatever. <laughs> I just, right? About that. Uh, but yeah, road cycling's not dying here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I could see it dying in other places for sure, especially uh, places with not not as awesome road cycling. You know, we have great road cycling here. Uh, GMR, GRR, uh, two roads, Glendora Mountain Road and Glendora Ridge Road are probably the two most beautiful roads I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if someone says that they're bored riding those two roads, they're also lying to you. <laughs> riding those two roads, they're beautiful. Uh, cool. Well, thanks uh, so much, Kyle, for being on the show. And if you guys have any other questions for Kyle, leave those in the comments below. I'll try to get them to answer them. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, totally. Thanks again for listening or watching this episode of PLP Talks. If you enjoyed it and want to see more, don't forget to uh, click in the description or the show notes to see how you can support it directly. And one last thing, if you discovered this podcast via iTunes, go to your podcast app and don't forget to rate and review it. Let us know what you think. It really helps with the visibility of the show. And until next time, ride bikes, travel, and do good.